Um, I now have the absolute pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker. Um, she was born here in Te Whanganui Atara, Wellington, um, has whakapapa links to the top of the South, um, South Island as well, Te Taui, who has eight iwi who have mana whenua connections there. Um, and uh, we, have, uh, we, but we have a connection there by having whakapapa links there. Um, we spoke briefly before the day started and what I heard um, from Helen was the concept of working in collaboration across sector so both in health and social services for some of our most vulnerable whānau. Um, Helen Robinson is our GM, our leader of the Auckland City Mission and is going to talk to us about that mahi, how to work in a collaborative way. So no mai, hara mai, kia ora Helen. I always think it's good to have applause before you start. <laughs> ena iwi, ena mana, na karangatanga maha o te motu, aku, aku mihi maioha ki a koutou katoa. He rangi whakihirahira tēnei, he rangi ti matahia, na mahi na tahi, na mahi pā hiko hiko ki te manaki na tangata o mātou hapori. Ko waikwe, ko tamarau no ronga i te rangi, ko rongo uirua te tupuna hiki iho ki a pari te rangi. Ko te ati awa no ronga i te rangi, ko te ati awa o te waka a Maui te manutaki nei. Ko ahau te manutaki o te tāpui atawhai, ko Helen Robinson tō koingua. Welcome everyone and thank you for the privilege, the utter privilege actually, of being here with you today. My name is Helen Robinson and I am the Manutaki or the Auckland City Missioner. Um, sometimes the most simplest way of explaining that is the Chief Executive of the Auckland City Mission. I am here today with three of my colleagues, I think they were the ones doing the applause and shouting by the way, uh, just to acknowledge here Jilly Sinclair who is the leader of our health services sitting next to Jackie Dillon who is the general manager of health and social services at the mission sitting next to Joanne Reedy who is our um, um, manutia or Pomari at the Auckland City Mission. Um, I know I'm standing up here, but actually behind me there is over 200 staff, or well, certainly these three extraordinary women, 200 staff and literally thousands of volunteers that make the truth uh, or the, the reality of uh, the Auckland City Mission just who we are. So I acknowledge all of those today and all who have gone before me. I have to say um, it has been a delightful start this morning. Um, I was just thinking uh, we've had mihi, we've had uh, karakia, we've had waiata, uh, we've had beautiful song, we've had laughter, um, we uh, then have had well-being um, and I hope, um, I just actually just want to acknowledge I think before I begin just the layers and layers of welcome and I think I particularly do want to acknowledge in all of that a man called Matthew. I walked in with my suitcases this morning and he recognised me, gave me the most beautiful smile and said hello Helen welcome go this way. And I particularly want to reference that sense of manakitanga that has layers and layers and layers that is not just as simple as a, as a kind of one shot entry. Um, and that to acknowledge the people who have begun today actually, certainly in making me feel welcome, Matthew began it, but actually all that has happened today really has been preparing us uh, if not for this moment, then a moment throughout the day where we are open and able, I think, to actually receive whatever it is we need to receive today. So I particularly want to acknowledge uh, the leaders of the symposium and the care that's just implicit in the layers and layers, the mats have been laid. So I acknowledge that and thank you. 
Um, there's loads that we can talk about today. Um, I'm conscious that I say the word the Auckland City Mission and I suspect about two thirds, if not three quarters of the room go, who are they? What's that? Uh, there'll be some of you who will know a little bit about who we are at the Auckland City Mission. And um, I'll talk a little bit about who we are, our history. And particularly, we have been asked to talk today about a thing called home ground. And you're gonna get to know a little bit more about that. Uh, and six months ago, or literally actually, on the 24th of December, I was handed the keys to a brand new building that's taken us 15 years to get there. Uh, we moved our services into that brand new building on the 11th of February. And while the building is extraordinary, and it really is extraordinary, it's actually what the possibility of that building enables. Um, and we'll begin to talk a little bit more about that. And then really what I have been asked to share with today is my and our reflections about what does it mean to be in partnership? What does it mean to be authentically connected and connected with each other, actually? And then what can unfold when all of that happens? So that's just a really brief snapshot of today. The Auckland City Mission is 102 years old. I have been uh, the missioner for 18 months and I felt terrible because the first year I forgot our birthday. Um, I've said I'll never do it again, so that's on the 8th of June. So I've now done two birthdays. Um, and we were founded by a man called Jasper Calder, and you're going to hear a little bit about him because the name of our primary health care centre and our services is the Calder Centre. So one of the lovely things whenever we talk about the Calder Centre, I'm actually calling into, into reality in the present day moment our tipuna. So Jasper Calder himself is certainly here with us today. He was the first city missioner 102 years ago, and I am now the 10th. He began, ironically, the Auckland City Mission in the face of the Spanish pandemic or the flu. And I have to tell you, when I became uh, the missioner, well, just over 18 months ago, the deep irony of 100 years ago, here we are again. Uh, he was distraught um, at what he was seeing in Auckland at the time and essentially a lack of services that were being delivered to people. Uh, we papa through to the Anglican Church, he was part of that, and said we must do something. And I think the extraordinary sense from the Anglican Church is that I think they both loved and tolerated Jasper. Um, and I, so I really do think there was this lovely sense of, okay, go and kind of shut up, but not shut up. Go and do what you need to do because you are driving us crazy. And in doing so, he founded the, or one of the certainly an extraordinary organization that is deeply connected to Tamaki Makoto that says whatever the mission is about, we are about finding the face of suffering in our city and responding to that. And we have a particular um, call really to the face of suffering that is not being attended to at all. We're not about a particular thing. Um, because over our 102 year history, we dip in and out of each particular thing, just depending on what's going on in the history at that time. Today, we have three main areas of focus, which certainly on behalf of us and, and those in Tamaki, actually describes what we see as the extraordinary level of unmet need and suffering. Um, I started at the mission nine years ago, and in that year we did 9,000 food parcels. So to get a food parcel at the mission, you've got to have a street address. No great philosophy behind that, you just need a place to store and cook food. Uh, every one of those food parcels feeds a family of uh, four for three meals for four days. In the last financial year, we did 65,000 food parcels. I have gone on record, and I will again go today, that New Zealand has come to accept that we have a housing crisis. We have a food crisis. The best information that I have at the moment is that 20,000 food parcels are distributed across Tamaki every week. So we think close to 20% of Aotearoa does not have enough food today. We believe 40% of South Auckland does not have enough food today. And the deep, deep root of that is actually just an adequate income. There's not enough money coming in against what needs to go out. 
and we can talk and I could talk more and more about this but I'll shut up in a minute and move on is that overwhelmingly it is women who are bearing the burden of this poverty and overwhelmingly single women raising children how dare we morally tend to raise children alone and particularly Māori and Pacific women so yes this is about poverty but this is about sexism and this is about colonization and it is about racism we face deep into the shadows of who we are as a nation. We proudly have a range of healthcare services and two very, very important ones, the Calder Centre, so named after Jasper Calder, you get the sense, um, and that is our primary healthcare centre. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on, so I won't go into too much detail now. We also have a social detox unit. So this is for people who need support in the withdrawal process. Uh, we started that service in the early 1980s. I'm really, really proud to say. Uh, when we moved into our new building, we actually went to the DHB and said, do you reckon you fellas could take it over from now? And they said, please keep it open. We are the only social detox service in all of Auckland in our new building delightfully and quite extraordinarily the medical detox unit so the hospital has come to the mission so we now actually have two floors in our brand new building our social detox service and the medical unit just kind of have tucked in your head 15 percent of us have an alcohol or any other drug problem so to have 25 beds for all of auckland you start to get a sense of what story is being told in terms of housing, I can proudly but tragically also say that the Auckland City Mission, I think actually was the first provider in Tamaki, if not throughout our country, to deal and respond to the reality of people who were rough sleeping. <coughs> We saw this particularly, we saw the beginning of this in the 1990s, that obviously has just grown and grown and grown. We now have a range of services, we provide support and emergency housing, we have a number of transitional housing services, including a very special one called Te Wharehina Tore, which is a kaupapa Māori service uh, run by women for women alone. We have a, a range of uh, permanent housing in our brand new building I'll talk to you about in a minute. We have 80 permanent homes and we've just leased another building, provide scattered site support. We importantly also run what's called an outreach team so that we have a team of all kinds of people and professional skill base that will go out to our people literally every day. So I don't know the names of everyone who is living on the street in Tamaki, but I can tell you that our teams do. So that extraordinary power of relationship that knows just actually what's going on in our city. So you can see, um, actually, just to give you a really little taste, why I am so wildly proud uh, to be part of the mission and to be its leader. This just gives you a, a little bit of a detail. Um, I didn't know this when I began, but actually we had a medical centre in 1929. Um, it has it closed since, but there is this truth that uh, the mission does go deep into the places where people need us to go. Uh, that 1980s, that's what I talked about, a social withdrawal service. Again, really proudly, we provided the first HIV AIDS clinic uh, in our country in a time when the hospitals wouldn't have a bar of it. Um, and as a really, really good example, actually, uh, we closed that service when actually it has been picked up by the general health care of our country. So it's a good example of the mission is not about a thing. It's actually just about finding that face of suffering and then responding appropriately. In the early 1980s, we bought a derelict pub, and it literally was a derelict pub. When I hear the stories, um, it took some time to literally clean it up. And at the time, we bought a couple of properties just behind it on Federal Street, and we have been living in that building, building in the 1980s. When I joined the mission nine years ago, one of the services that we did is that we provided dinner for people who are on the street every night. And we did that in a room that was probably half the size of this room. And at times we would have had up to 200 people to dinner. And to any of you who've lived in London like I have or been on a tube, um, it literally felt like I was on the tube every time that we were having kai together. And that was literally every night. In my wee little office, um, every time it rained, we had a water feature. Um, uh, in the medical centre that was growing beyond itself, we literally turned a cupboard into a nurse's office. 
So wherever I looked, what was happening for us is that we truly did not have a building that was fit for purpose. And we did not know what to do. And the beginning of that journey to our brand new building at home ground actually began uh, over, literally over 15 years ago. We are responding deep in the heart of Auckland City, responding to the needs of people who are extraordinarily desperate. The level of suffering is visceral and real and overwhelming. And we had no place to be able to respond to those needs. Now, an extraordinary journey has then unfolded, which has meant that we now have a brand new building called Home Ground. It's 11 storeys. We have 80 apartments, permanent housing for those most in need. We have two floors of a detox unit. We have a medical centre that's three times the size of what it was. We have a commercial kitchen to cook food every day for people who are coming in for Kai. We have community rooms. We have a whole range of stuff. Now, just to give you a taste of that, there are two videos that I'm about to play and so you can get over my voice for a moment. Uh, we're going to just play a very brief video that talks about the leaving ceremony of our place in Hobson Street. And then again, a very brief video that shows you the blessing of our brand new building. And once you get a taste of us through these moving images, I'll talk a little bit more about what it actually means to be part of the mission and what it means to be in collaboration. I don't know if I have to push a special button to get it playing. Would anyone know? One more click. And then we returned home. Yeah. 
believe we had the boldness of the vision and dream and that all these people have helped make it a reality. You know, the support of everyone has just been incredible. proud today as Manutaki to be blessing and opening the home ground. Every person who walks in the store here at home ground knows that, that they are welcome, uh, that they are worthy and that uh, we look forward to getting to know them actually, just being talking to people and listening. We were gifted some of the, the rock. Those uh, important pieces, this like the heart of the, of the home and the heart of the building. It's a, it's a complicated, beautiful building, but the thing that goes on inside in the future is the exciting thing you're on. I know that everybody who crosses this threshold will be transformed by just coming here. will be the moment where we bless and actually we bless through our presence we bless through daring to be here and so what I claim here for us today is yes a building of wood and concrete and brick and mortar and steel but so much more importantly I claim a building here where the energy is laid in the truth of that compassion and the truth of that justice and the truth of the energy of the search for a people and a reality where everybody belongs. This is a contribution to Auckland, um, it's a contribution to humanity and as architects what more can you do? You don't just want to be doing commercial architecture, you want to do something, you want to do important work that helps humanity. been sitting in front of donors so often saying here's the vision these are the pretty pictures and actually they come now and say but it's exactly what you showed us it's exactly what you said it would be and it's wonderful just to see this vision realized Needless to say, I no longer have a water feature when it rains. <laughs> the, the, the wider of those two are big, so I'll just allow a, a moment. <laughs> You will have seen on the video uh, a man speak who was the former uh, city missioner. When we did that video, he was Chris Farrelly, but now he's Sir Chris Farrelly. Uh, so I will acknowledge him and his knighthood uh, and actually as one of the extraordinary leaders in our country, but particularly in terms of health. He used to say that the Calder Centre, which is our primary health care centre, was the jewel in the crown of the mission. Uh, speaking to you as a group of people, you will understand how extraordinarily powerful it makes us to be able to offer primary health care literally there in the moment when there is l people there who are so deeply suffering. So the ability to be able to respond with that. We're one of the very few primary health care practices that is deeply integrated into social services. And I was uh, reflecting this morning, actually, I don't know who ever came up with this health social service construct. It's, it is just a construct. I could argue very easily that every one of the services that the mission provides are health services. 
And I could argue very easily that every of the services that the mission provides are social services. That construct is not helping us anymore. And we are being called into a time that actually just says, who is the person and the whānau in front of me right now? And what do I need to be able to respond to the needs that they are presenting with? We're a really small practice. There will be people in the room that have hundreds of thousands of people. About two thirds of that 1800 are people who are either very vulnerably housed, uh, ha um, housed or rough sleepers. Um, one of the big challenges that presents with us a number of years ago, we were de uh, declared the highest need practice in the country. I don't literally know if that would still exist this year, but we're certainly up there, is that all constructs of how a normal primary health care centre don't work in our place. Uh, appointments don't work, 15 minute appointments don't work, uh, telling people that they can't come back because they've uh, presented with challenging behaviour and or active addictions don't work. I'll briefly touch over this because I think it's just a, I don't want to distract us with COVID, but I think we are incredibly proud of what we were able to do. And I genuinely stand with you because of the relationships that we had, because of the primacy of the primary health care centre, the power of our work. Uh, very early on in the Delta outbreak, we were doing surveillance testing before anyone was even really allowed to do surveillance testing. We were supported, I have to acknowledge, by the DHB to do that. What that meant is, is that we were named as one of the first places of interest. If you can remember, we had those places of interest named. Um, and that is purely because of the passion and the bravery and the intelligence of our primary healthcare professionals who said, it is dumb if we are not. Our people are literally coming every day for Kai. Let's use that opportunity to see what we can do to respond. So it's just a really, really small example of what is possible when the integration is like that and it's not wildly separated. We have the gift of the health world meets the gift of the social service world. And then both of us are better because of it. And perhaps more importantly, the people that we are serving are better because of it. Briefly, just talking about our detox unit there. And I think this really becomes, as I've laid the mats today, just the beginning of, of a real conversation here. And there are two parts that I want to, it won't be for too long, because I am conscious people have been sitting there for a while, uh, about two concepts of uh, collaboration and partnership. And the first is our commitment to be a Tatriti partner. There is a, a tragic irony that we are an organisation that whakapapas to the Anglican Church and that we are now, if I was to quote Joanne Reedy sitting here, simply mopping up the impact of colonisation. And that tragic irony of, uh, of me as a leader very genuinely sits with me each and every day. Uh, we are deep on a journey and I genuinely feel that we are really only a peppy or a baby at the very beginning of that journey. Uh, a number of years ago, under the leadership of Sir Chris Farrelly, we sought a kaumatua and a formal relationship with Ngāti Whātua Ōrāke, one of the mana whenua in Tāmaki Makaurau. We, uh, only three years ago, got a treaty policy. Uh, only three years ago, got our first Māori board members on our governance structure. And as part of this journey, uh, two years ago, we asked for a Māori ingoa or a Māori name. And that ensued a deep process when in July of last year, we were gifted that name to Tāpui Atawhai. And at the receipt of that name, both myself uh, and the chair of our board formally stood up to those who were gathered and apologised for our contribution to colonisation and our contribution to the harm that we now see on a day-to-day -day basis. Subsequent to that, we have our first Po Māori, so I introduced you to Joanne before, our Manutia, and we are now, uh, Joanne has led us in the development of a senior Māori caucus across the organisation. We're at the very beginning of developing a Titiriti caucus so that there is another entity within the organisation to uh, respond to those conversations. And I think there is, wherever I lay my eyes or my eyes rest across the organisation, I see lack. 
I see a lack of a te ao Māori lens. I certainly see a lack of resources. I see a lack of power sharing. So I stand here today extraordinarily proud of this organisation, conscious that two thirds of the work that we do is literally mopping up the impact of colonisation and acknowledging that we are at the very, very beginning of the journey. So I genuinely don't know whether I should be deeply ashamed or deeply proud. I genuinely don't know if I should be deeply ashamed or deeply proud. And it is in that spirit of humility and vulnerability that I declare it. It's not hard for me to stand up and tell you about how good we are. It is a lot harder for me to say we acknowledge that we have contributed to the harm that we now see walk inside the door every day. As part of a Matariki celebration uh, or acknowledgement this year, we had a service to acknowledge those who have passed. If you are a rough sleeper, your body is 20 years chronologically older than its age. So if you're 50, you're 70. So what that means is that our people die early. Um, and I read uh, the names of 26 individuals, two thirds of Māori, all of them under the age of 60. It is with the greatest of humility that we do stand in that place. And I spend a lot of my time daring to ask Aotearoa to be brave enough to see what's in front of its own face or our own face. And I'm conscious that as a leader, I have to have some integrity to be willing to do that, certainly for myself and the organisation that I so proudly lead. I long to be part of a country where we are brave enough to be honest. And I long to be part of a country where we are brave enough to stand in the humility for both the harm that has and is occurring. And brave enough to say it does not have to continue to be this way. This is all a construct. We're making it this way. And as soon as I figured that out, I think of my first year of university, then I was like, okay, we've got an option then. And there is another way. Knowing what it's like to be at the mission, we are part of the gift of us is that we deepen this food and deepen this housing and deepen this health space but that's also our complexity. And what we are is deep into the suffering of people. And when I view that particularly from a health frame, I have to acknowledge the utter frustration that myself and other people and leaders throughout the mission feel that I don't feel heard. I suspect I'm in a room with people who also don't feel heard. Now this is all prefaced against the thousands of people who support the mission, particularly in a health construct, the individuals of whom are extraordinary, good people, trying to do the best for us. The only way that we can keep the call to centre open is because we literally shake a can and go to Auckland and say that $600,000 a year that we lose, Auckland, can you pay that for us, please? And that's not our whole budget, that's just the quarter centre. Why are we, who are looking after some of our most vulnerable, having to shake a can so that we can respond to the very real needs of people? I literally have had Jackie regulate me in a meeting to say, Helen, if you keep going, you are going to cause harm. And actually, by and large, 97 times out of 100, it's quite hard to get me going. 
my problem which I suspect is your problem, is that I literally see the face of that suffering. And we literally have the skills and the services to respond to that suffering. We need a people and a system that actually acknowledges that we know something. And we have a lot to learn. We know something, and when we ask, trust and allow the resources appropriate for that trust to flow. We also lose big money on our detox unit. The only way I keep that open is again through our fundraising team that goes to Auckland and says, please support the Auckland City Mission. What is going on? So in this deep sense of, of um, partnership, there is an acknowledgement that actually at the mission, compared to the health world, we are nothing. We are this big. We, we look after thousands, not millions of people. We certainly look after people who have no power, no resources and no voice. listen and trust and in that acknowledgement we acknowledge we need you we desperately need you your passion your heart your skill your understanding because what is possible in that sense of partnership when the vulnerability of the other is acknowledged, both mine and yours, whoever the yours is, and an acknowledgement of the gift, both in the gift that I bring and the gift that is possible to receive, then we save lives. Then we change the world. From where I sit, the illness, the symptom is obesity. Well, the symptom is diabetes, or the symptom is hunger. Actually, the illnesses are threefold, and they're all deeply related. One is poverty, one is trauma, and the greatest is colonization. It is killing our people. And I long for a vaccine. I cannot be clearer or more specific. We have something to offer and we desperately try to do so, often inadequately, often in the midst of chaos. I could only welcome you into the chaos of the mission. <laughs> but with heart, a kind of tikka and a pono, like a, a right way, and for us, the heart of that begins and ends always in relationship. I don't know who you are, and you don't know who I am. It's all over. We can't even begin. And relationship takes time, and relationship costs money. And relationship is our way through. When I was asked to speak about collaboration, I, I, I did so, but you can also understand now why I did it with such a complex set of feelings. If I view it from a titiritu lens, shamed, proud. If I view it from a health social service lens, we have such a gift to offer and there are so many good people there and we are not being heard. And deeply, deeply underpinning that is the dis-ease or the disease that as a country we must be brave enough to attend to and to see in its first instance. The impact of poverty. The consequence of trauma. 
and the deep, deep shadow of colonisation. It's extraordinary for me to stand up here and talk about the ill when actually I come today with a very, very genuine sense of joy. Because what we do, and I suspect what you do, actually is making quite a difference. And that building that you saw uh, was $110 million. Uh, at the beginning, our board had eight million. That has been fundraised for. After a 15-year journey, it was only two months ago we got the last five million. Miracles are possible. And it truly begins with the bravery of people who are saying, what is in front of me? And more importantly, who is in front of me? And how am I called to respond? And how are we called to respond? The journey of Tatapui Atafai of the Auckland City Mission is about a seeking of the we. Please come in the waka with us or perhaps allow us to go into yours. And together, and only together, we will reach a reality in a hundred years time when the 20th Auckland City Missioner is standing here, and we will be saying that there is a reality. I'll be doing this equally in Te Reo in English. And we will be saying this reality of colonization that is now our past. I dream of that. An idea to say it out loud. Thank you. Um, and we do have a little bit of time for any questions. So while we're thinking about that, um, taking the opportunity to bask in the sobering words that have been shared here. So questions either up the front or give us a wave and we'll bring, um, bring the mic down. Hello. Kia ora. I would like very much to thank you. It isn't often you see and feel a passion. You ask the question, am I to be disappointed or proud? Inside, I am sobbing. I'm sobbing, it is the strength of Kōrero that you have brought forward that sparks, instigates, motivates. It was actually one that made me feel that it gives you the permission 
in a way to know. Other people are thinking like me. Other people need to know that someone else has got the gate open. Other people need to know this was a risk back then in old pub. You speak about the cost. You take us through the building being restored. You show us the services, the people using it. But it was that whole monarchy thing that you had included. Disappointed? No. Proud? Yes. And yet that's not where you feel you might want to stand. Please. The kaha that you have shown, not only to deliver the complexity of that corridor, when you speak about collaboration, fully, fully seen, fully explained and felt. I can't even begin to say more. All I know is that my heart is just full and the tears that are falling is because you had so many answers and nuggets in what you were saying about how you got to where everybody is. Someone else might ask you something else actually concerning what you need. <laughs> no, I am so full from, from that. The things that Yadua uh, will do, you planted other seeds for us. And then for everything that you were doing and you let us look through your window to see that absolutely amazing i have such a fullness that is all around me Something that really resonated in the video that you shared was um, the writing that said, we have come too far not to go further. We have done too much not to do more. But we have to do that in a different way. It cannot be in the same way it has always been. It has to be a new, innovative, collaborative ways. So with that challenge that you've set, Helen, um, I want to thank you on behalf of one. Kia ora.